Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I think you've all got better things to do, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> OK, so uh, I'll try to stay on point. I have a reputation for kind of going off on tangents and wandering. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, maybe a 45 at the fat end. Um, and I'm going to, um, I'm not going to include any, um, I have done set designs. Basically, I'm just concentrating on my studio based work tonight, which is um, primarily sculpture and drawing. Um, I'm going to be doing a review. Well, this is too much, you know. It's like, anyway, I got to say this. I'll be re re uh, doing a review of um, some very early work and then concentrating predominantly on the most recent work. So I'm going to, you'll see this image pop up and I'll talk a little bit more about it later. It was on the announcement for tonight's talk. Um, and I'm kind of using it like as a benchmark through different periods in which I'm going to be talking about tonight. So this is an introduction. I'm going to kind of talk over these, these particular works and not go into them in detail. Um, I'll go into the most recent work in more detail. But it starts, I'm starting around 1986, and um, I uh, graduated um, with an MFA in Pratt at Pratt Institute in Sculpture, like Harlan had said, um, in 1983. So growing up in Portland, Oregon, I was, um, at the time, uh, there was not a lot going on in terms of um, the art scene, so to speak. But I did spend time at the Portland Art Museum. The Portland Art Museum had a, um, or has a, uh, a cr incredible collection of indigenous um, Pacific Northwest art. And um, as a young, I don't know how old I was, maybe, 10 or 11 or 12 even. And uh, I thank my mother for this because she would take me to the Portland Library and made sure I checked out some books now and again. And on those occasions, I would go to the Portland Art Museum and be wowed by the indigenous um, art that was in their collection, particularly the masks and um, um, other artifacts. Um, I always, worked in kind of a hybrid fashion, um, quoting both um, contemporary elements, classical elements in the Western genre, um, indigenous art, um, uh, other cultures that I was um, inspired by and looking at. And um, these particular works, um, I always saw as a hybrid um, of kind of constructivist elements, um, uh, tribal arts, um, figuration, cubism, classicism, like Hami Shalakwan, which is the image on the left. Uh, so these kinds of serpentine forms were evident in the work. Also in showing this, um, Previous work is kind of a grounding or, or beginning of an arc. Um, but in preparing for this lecture and in other occasions as well, um, I see the dots. So there are things that keep on repeating um, that uh, thread throughout uh, my, my work to date. Now, I'm not a... Um, I, I would describe, I'm not a morbid person. I like to think of myself as very optimistic, but I am uh, essentially an existentialist. <laughs> you know, I kind of think this is kind of it. And um, I'm interested in, um, well, that went off on a track. Okay, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, basically, um, I've always been fascinated by tomb sculpture on the aggrandizement of an individual through one's funerary appointments, if you will. So um, on, on early trips to um, Italy and Florence, I was just kind of wowed by the um, tombs of the Medicis and um, their size, their scale, um, the rare materials in which they were made uh, were all signals um, and signifiers of someone important. So I always enjoyed um, 
that ability for someone to be present or someone's um, um, position to be present. Um, and also architecturally in terms of design and all these things have kind of been an influence throughout the work. Um, furniture, furniture making. Uh, one of my go-tos in college was Martin Purrier. And Martin Purrier was, um, you know, most people are familiar with his work. Um, there's a lot going on there. I mean, for, for Purrier specifically, there's very strong sculptural uh, uh, um, heritage and cultural reference for him as a um, African-American. But at the same time, um, uh, he studied in Sweden, he studied cabinetry, bolt building, and his work um, was always kind of a beautiful amalgam of all these sources. And basically, it's it's kind of a combination of an artist um, working from who they are and what they're curious about and what they want to know about. So I kind of emulate that or try to emulate that position where I, I um, look at a lot of things. I'm very curious about a lot of things and also materially, sculpturally, um, these things we look at, these things that we hybridize for our work um, is what we can do with that. And then somebody else will do something with that, hopefully. Also the titles, this title is Trunk. So it's certainly um, a lot of the work is figural in nature, figurative in nature. This was a piece that was um, specifically referencing the uh, Medici Chapel, Medici Chapel. And um, this is my kind of um, rocker variation as kind of my homage to that impression that I had. And this is a curious piece. These were balanced on their bottoms, um, precariously so, um, replicating kind of a classical, almost um, Renaissance floor. And um, they are boxes, tomb boxes, figurations on their head, a cruciform, a, um, a, a baby's um, um, cradle. Curious about these. Sometimes these things are clearer in retrospect. So it's not like I, you know, I, I'm the kind of artist that will, you know, if I'm doing one piece, I'll often figure out what that first piece was by the fourth or fifth piece. And so there's always a combination of reflection and and um, and um, after construction, if you will. Materially, I like to move through things. So I I work in the studio. I'm a studio-based artist. Um, I work uh, mostly by myself. The large projects I've done, I've had help. Uh, and I'm mentioning that not because I think there's any, well, personally, I, I think um, there's a relationship to materials, tools, and processes that I couldn't have if I wasn't doing it myself. But also I need that um, to think, to think through things. Uh, sculpture is an interesting medium, not unlike maybe some other mediums where um, you have a lot of time to think, uh, meaning you have to make something to make something to make something else. So there's lots of steps and processes involved um, and lots of delays. So it gives you a lot of thinking time. Um, and so that's a part of the process that I really enjoy. So uh, I'm mentioning that, that I'm um, fairly solitary in the studio aside from these projects. I'll share some drawing with you um, a little later, but continually throughout my practice, drawing has always been a big part of it, what I do. And, um, and uh, so often I would uh, exhibit the drawings along with the work. You know, I, I um, my formative time as a, as a young artist, I was 
taken by minimalism, which um, a lot of artists were, but uh, particularly the um, California artists, the Finnish fetish artists like Craig Kaufman or Helen Pash Pashkian, um, Dwayne Valentine, and uh, the use of materials and plastic, uh, as well as elements of shine and just simply luxuriousness um, is something I, I um, was attracted to or am attracted to. I guess I was talking about uh, when I brought up the minimalism with the previous images that um, in this period, I was really questioning notions of abstraction and uh, playing with ideas about its meaninglessness as well as its, 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 its contrary ability to move you and, um, and to have an um, aesthetic experience and also to create a place for you to um, for the viewer to roam, um, uh, not purely free association, but also to bring themselves to it, what they have to see themselves in the work in somehow, some way. Um, okay, I'm gonna move through these a little quicker. Processes of material change. Uh, these were cast in fiberglass and resin. I do a lot of mold making now, as you'll see later, and casting. Um, the quality of the finish was always very important to me, and it would also drive me crazy. Um, but I wanted them to have an industrial look, um, a machine look. Uh, while they are totally handmade, totally by my hand. Um, and it's kind of an off compliment, but I remember when I was exhibiting this work in particular, someone came up to me and said, hey, where'd you buy those? So I was kind of always curious about that kind of dissonance or disconnect um, between my hand making and this kind of impression of it being ubiquitous and out in the world as, as some sort of commercial product. A lot of times I'll look at advertising. Um, this was actually riffing on a, um, my wife is Swedish and we traveled to Sweden and all over in the summertime, they would have these kind of um, cardboard cutout clowns with a big smiley grin um, enticing you to come in for some ice cream. So I was enjoying those smiles so much that I um, kind of abstracted it and turned it into um, I think kind of a strange uh, thing. Um, and this is my teen meditation. Okay. This was a sampling up till uh, from 86 up to about 2000. Um, 10. And so here's my bookmark again. So now I'm going to kind of go in a little deeper into the current work. Um, okay. Here's, here's a part of a word list. Now, one of the things I like to do, and, and other people do too, uh, in my classes is create um, or have students actually for each other um, visit each other in their studios and create a list of descriptors. So um, one of the exercises I like to do early on in the semester is have um, each student um, visit each other's studio and generate a list of adjectives, nouns, and abstract nouns um, based on their reception of the work in front of them. Um, then that's given back to the artist, and the artist has a has a word list, which could be fodder for 
um, further um, conceptual thinking. Uh, it could be um, a bank of vocabulary that might end up in a statement or um, further research. Um, so these are partially mine, um, things I've been thinking about. You know, I, I look at a lot of contemporary art um, and I'm very pluralistic. Um, I like a lot of different kinds of art for different reasons. Um, but this seems to be a grounding for me, this kinds of thinking, uh, immortality or, sorry, ooh, that's a slip, immortale, mausoleums, baroque, finished fetish, shining, object theory, ornament, seduction, vanitas, desire, melancholy, moment, memento mori, or vacui, flora, invasives, invasives, indigenous. Okay. This is the um, Portland Mausoleum in Portland, Oregon. Um, very interesting place. The reason I'm showing you this is because um, this is our, our most of our family is interned there, um, relatives, uncles, aunts. My father is interned there. Um, and um, as a child, um, after a particular funeral, we would go, my mother, my father would um, adorn um, the relatives or uncles or aunts um, a tomb with freshly cut flowers. Um, this made such an incredible impression on me. And this kind of thinking came very late, maybe um, fairly recently, maybe in the last 15 years. Um, when I was starting to thread these interests together. Now, when I go to Portland again, I will visit my father who is there. Um, but I'd like to talk about this, not so much as a personal association, but as an association of signifiers uh, or, or a, a compilation of signifiers. So this thing, it's, a, it's a really interesting architectural place. It's eight stories, seven stories subterranean below ground. So this is below ground, given the illusion of light. Um, uh, each floor repeats itself. Um, so you, you're, you have to have a floor plan. You, you can easily get lost. And I had a little fun fact. Um, there's four miles of corridors within this mausoleum. So this kind of gives you a sense of um, a wall. The hallways are so long that they go into a um, perspectival uh, view. Um, the cutting of the flowers is really important. The smell of the roses the angling of the stem, the clipper. These were all things that I remember. This is a, these are contemporary photographs that I took um, at a visit, um, probably when I visited my father or other relatives there. Um, so I wanted to capture what it was that I remembered about the place. Now, this is curious too. Now this, you know, I was just, my wife and I are staying in a hotel in a couple of days. And I didn't want this to be like a Yelp review where I'm kind of pointing out <laughs> the flaws in the motel room. But this is um, a curtain in the mausoleum. This is an interesting signifier. It's a reminder that beyond the shininess, beyond the perfection, beyond the facade, time does not stop. Things erode. There's a futility. Um, things need to be maintained, up kept, kept up. So this frayed curtain in and of itself, which I'm sure has been replaced and all that, is for me a very significant moment or observation to this condition. Sorry, this was a little joke, uh, not an exit, no admittance. Um, also the stairwell, I'm gonna get a better view when I go back and visit another time, but it's, it's, like, it's like Squid Game, it's like, um, it's like an Escher drawing. It just keeps repeating and repeating and repeating. This is in um, the Isle of Saint Michel in Venice, um, Cemetery Island, essentially established in eighteen oh seven. The 
the idea of the immortality, uh, which is the is the flower. It's the it's the group of flowers that are adorning the um, the grave. Now um, they have to be replaced, otherwise they die. Often they are substituted by plastic flowers, which um, don't need any maintenance. So they 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 um, always have the impression of of, of uh, being tended to. So so materiality, the significance of these things is is important. Um, This is Sarpota's uh, chapel. Um, ornamentation, decoration. The idea of the horror vacui, as I'm sure you all remember in, in your art history classes, is the idea that no space is left untouched. Um, there's no empty space. And what I love about the horror vacui, especially how it operates in um, Christianity, um, Arabic cultures, Muslim cultures have this as well, um, is the eye never rests. So, um, and there was something, at least in the, in the Christian faith, that um, uh, the surfaces were kept busy um, so your mind would not wander, hence uh, you would not let the devil in. Um, you, would, you would be keep aspiring, looking out, looking outward, looking upward. Now, floral imagery. How are we doing on time, Harlan? Sorry. Okay. Wow. So let me let me try to get this down to fifteen. So. Um, I told Harlan before I started that I was showing new material. And so I didn't have a good sense of the time. So I'm gonna to have to rush through these. These are some of my influences. Um, the botanical prints and drawings are, you know, there's a whole, whole history. A lot of artists work with flowers, floral imagery. They are a, a container, they are containers um, or vessels for meaning. Um, uh, they could be observational as in the one on the left. Um, they're, um, symbols or representations um, of other things. This is a wisteria vine I, I photographed with a pot and this is Laquan group. Um, so the serpentine wrapping forming images is uh, um, something I continue. So I started working with the clusters in 2012 and um, I wanted, just kind of piggybacking on these kinds of ideas, um, creating, using the floral imagery as kind of like a, um, a uh, placeholder, if you will, uh, to represent one's um, ideas of beauty, uh, desire, um, making it as dense and as complicated as I could. These are all um, individually modeled and cast. Uh, it's kind of an arduous process, but uh, so looking at um, surfaces um, and wanting them to be attractants, you know, glossy glitter coats, custom car painting comes to mind. Um, it's basically a skin. Um, but I'm always interested in the melancholic. It's like that torn curtain. There's something behind that's a little off. That's not quite, a not quite right, a little dark. You know, very aware of, of when they, especially a larger piece like this, it, be, it becomes um, um, imagistic. Uh, it has a um, anthropomorphic feel uh, to it. Um, it's very figural, is what I was trying to say.
this was a project um, to meet the scale. I had to strip down the adornment. Um, I called them beauties. And it's kind of almost tongue in cheek. Some of the images looked almost like uh, sex toys, if you will. But, uh, you know, and I kind of let that happen. But um, also, um, I saw them as almost like actors on a stage, um, preening, uh, presenting themselves. These were, this was a part of an exhibition at Studio 10 um, in Bushwick. I guess the besetting flowers, um, they're kind of, um, all bowing their heads. Quick view of process. So each flower form is, is modeled, uh, a mold is made of each flower form, and then they're cast individually, and then I'll have a vocabulary, various sets of different types. And there's more tricks that I, I won't divulge at the moment, but, but uh, uh, those eventually get assembled and um, part of a larger whole. Okay, my placeholder again. This is representing the current work, um, hearts and stems, clusters and ovals. Um, each of those titles represents two different exhibitions. Uh, titles are really important. I can't say I always get them right. Um, hearts and stems, I felt like I got right. Clusters and ovals kind of reminds me of, of, of uh, well, it's it's sort of it's non-committal. I want I wanted to work on that. I'm just sharing that. Some of those early geometries, the Renaissance ovals, ovals was and Baroque. The idea of, of dynamic shapes, dynamic form, um, um, very seductive, um, uh, lots of movement. Um, This is a um, photograph of a reliquary display in Venice. And I'm showing this to you. Um, and there's kind of a close up. You know, there's a lot, a lot of interest and things written about the idea of shining. Now, shining is also as a representation of things, but also as a uh, metaphor. Um, Certainly, um, shiny is um, about an attractant. Um, it's almost everlasting life in a way, but it takes maintenance. It's also um, an incredible kind of propaganda. Uh, it bespeaks of power um, and authority um, and pure seduction. So, you know, a shout out to lowrider culture and those incredible um, paints. Uh, if you ever are inclined, you know, I would just spend hours and hours looking at YouTube videos of these master craftspeople painting these cars. Hours and hours, incredibly laborious. And what's really interesting with it, from what I know as a pedestrian, um, there's a real vocabulary to the pinstriping, the colors, the drop shadows, the shades, the metal flaking. And so you see these things repeated 
in different ways by different painters. So I like the, I only emulate that in as much as the surfaces are often very glossy, um, glitter, uh, glitter as an attractant. Um, um, put on this kind of like um, condensed Baroque kind of um, a conglomeration of, of, of imagery, um, vines and flowers. You know, you know the, the, the vines for me are these sculptures, I always saw them as, as um, um, aspirational in terms of like a representation of growth, a growth form but also at the same time, it's being thwarted, um, um, being denied by, by the strangulation of the vines. So each work is kind of um, maybe deals with that tension, kind of that moment of, of um, meeting between um, something, um, being affirmed and something being denied. Some of them take the um, form of almost like a funerary reef. And um, often these, you know, when I when I make the work, it's kind of like drawing in a way. Um, it's a lot of additive and subtract subtractive. And the way I work uh, with the vines are basically um, silicone casts of various diameters of pipe and lengths of pipe. So I'll have these very long molds um, um, that I'll cast in urethane resin. And I'll take the resin out before it's fully cured. And there's a, there's a pliable state. So I have maybe 10 minutes or so to work with it. So I'll wrap it in a, in a position, fix it. And then when it's cured, it's set in that position. Sometimes I'll come back and won't like what I did, then I'll cut, cut it off and so on and so forth. So it's very much back and forth. These, um, this work and, and most, some of the previous um, wall pieces were all titled heart cluster and then a designation of white or the color magenta, these different things. And the heart is very important in this heart cluster. So we're gonna um, look at the anatomy of this piece just for a moment. Um, so when it begins, this is the base of that particular work. Um, it's kind of like a simplified heart shape, almost like an emoji heart. Um, and um, so everything's emanating from that. So just some process images um, that shows you um, how it slowly builds. And it builds until, well, the heart is obscured at some point. I mean, if you really peer into the work, you can kind of make it out. But I like that it's, it is this foundational support for this work um, that's obscured by all this other craziness on top of it. Um, it's kind of curious if one thinks about these as some sort of figuration as the heart being kind of this internal presence internal presence.
So I showed that video. Um, you know, if one is the, you know, I like to reward the careful looker. So, um, so the video is kind of like a roaming eye. All right. Now the ovals uh, were um, certainly referencing uh, Vanitov, the idea of one's reflection, um, you know, the vanity of oneself. They did they did become kind of um, selfie bait in the <laughs> in the show, but um, but the whole idea of Vanitas, as we know. Um, uh, you know, has to do with um, it, it's it's the reflection of oneself as a reminder of one's mortality. Uh, it's and it's one of these signifiers that's often included in those um, those paintings from the 1700s and reminding us of our hubris and um, and so you know, there's several nods for me with the with the ellipses. Certainly, it's custom car culture. Certainly, it's a fetish finish, the California um, look, uh, historically, you know, from the uh, California minimalists. Um, certainly, Vanitas, uh, certainly Baroque, the dynamic um, ellipse, um, which echoes the ornamentation. So, this particular view of its self reflection is kind of speaking to that, although this image was simply staged for a um, promotional picture for the exhibition, but um, but it kind of says, for me, it kind of represents the intentionality of, of the works. Now, this gives you a sense of that surface. Um, these these pieces almost retired me because I <laughs> I you know um, you know it'd be almost like your your basically uh, these are carved foam foam um, uh, elliptical shapes that are shaped then they're um, fiberglass with a glass cloth and aqua resin which is a, a gypsum based um, resin acrylic based resin. Sanded, sanded, um, uh, top coated with various layers of color, candy color, um, uh, glitter coats, and then um, sanding in between, of course, and then layers of clear coat, and then sanding from like a 200 grit up to a 900 grit sandpaper. When you get to the end of something like that and you find an eyelash, in your clear coat, it's not fun. It's not fun. So I love the results, but you've got to like, I, I've learned I have to pace myself with this kind of work. Again, I'm doing it myself um, because that's how I make my work. It's not I, It's not a value judgment. It's just my relationship to the work. So it's it's a slow process. This is called Big Vine, and um, my neighbor, uh, uh, Jim Osmond, gave me this, um, he's a sculptor, and he gave me this um, uh, small little seedling of a plant, um, a trumpet vine. And so um, now it almost looks like anchor water in my backyard. So we have these huge vines on this wall. So a lot of these uh, vine shapes are uh, based on photographs that I had taken. And then stencils are made and then stencils are layered um, through various painting um, on this surface.
So these close-up views, um, again, reward the careful looker. So there's lots of uh, layering. Uh, the colorations are transparent. Um, and as you're trying to see it, you see your reflection. It's very hard to get that sense in the photograph, but they are a mirror reflection. Now it's interesting, I'll just very briefly, um, this is an abstraction, these individual kind of flower shapes are an abstraction of a chrysanthemum. And I was interested, um, not all the time, but um, sometimes I'll use their symbolic meaning of the flower. And uh, it means different things to different, it, it has different cultural references. Um, in Japan or Britain, for example, it means happiness. Uh, in China, it means life and good fortune. And in Belgium, Belgium and other European countries, it it's, means death and mourning. So again, um, we have this dialectic that I think um, it happens all the time, yeah. So this work is rounding out to my last bit here. I'm going to show you with some drawings soon. Uh, this was a piece that was kind of, well, actually, I'm not there yet. But I started to um, just deal with the stems or the vines, if you will. So this is titled Black Tendrils. And um, again, the angled cuts. I mean, these are knife pointed, um, I mean, it's urethane resin, but it it's, uh, certainly has a threatening nature about it. These were all made to sort of balance on their tips. So it was kind of interesting. Um, this is an installation view at the Elizabeth Harris Gallery. Um, the tipped work, the work on the floor, was all balanced on the tip. So they were countered by its um, its vine end. So it was a nice kind of like almost like a um, point of stasis, a point of balance that I was um, trying to find, um, and they're kind of. Uh, there together. This gives you a sense of uh, the room, um, spatial qualities, and its starkness. So recently, I was um, at a residency called uh, Kino Saito in Verplank, New York. And I mentioned that I always had drawn as part of my practice. Well, that's partially not true uh, because, um, I mean, one always draws in the studio to work out quick ideas, but drawing as a, as a form, as a, as a medium, um, I kind of stopped, you know, I, I had stopped and I kind of backdated it for almost 20 years. Well, actually 15, 16 years. I had not drawn a drawing in terms of um, a drawing for its medium as, as, a, as a thing in itself. And so this residency was a real test for myself to see if I could do that. So um, I ended up with this new, it kind of um, broke open something for me. I was there um, this past June and um, You know, and thinking about those um, botanical prints, uh, botanical drawings, um, and how fantastic in terms of, or surreal that imagery can be, 
it's certainly a reference for this work. There are also mechanical. You know, I I had a I had a big influence. This doesn't happen anymore, but but in my generation, or my I'm old enough to when I took my mechanical drawing and drafting class in call in high school and college, we were there with T squares and rulers and pens, and you had to um, put things in perspective, and um, and I still draw with those tools. So, so these are almost, um, I call them my mechanical drawings, if you will. Now, these are all abstractions of, of particular uh, types of flora. Um, and uh, the way I work is I'll draw, wipe down, draw, wipe down, and refine an area that I feel needs refining. So some of it will be left, some of it uh, will be um, further developed. Now I mentioned earlier that the flora form, especially, I'm not a botanist. I, I, I barely know the names of flowers I'm drawing or and I abstract half of what I do anyway. But I am interested in that um, types um, and also that history. So, so um, historically, when the botanists uh, uh, drew those flowers, they're driving them, drawing them for different reasons through different periods. Like, for example, very early on, they were almost like stand-ins for um, 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 for for um, religious iconography. Um, other times, it was scientific study. Um, other times, it was um, about pure aesthetics. Uh, so, so the flora form is really a vessel. I, I see it as really a vessel, um, a container. Um, uh, and for me, these these historical, it's a compounding. I would never, I'm not denying this historical origin, but I'm also um, wanting them to be, um, referential to things I'm looking at now, thinking about now. So it's an interesting, um, for me, compounding of, 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 uh, of um, I actually, you know what? All art making is a compounding, no matter what you think you're doing, it's, it's based on a series of events that led up to you doing what you're doing. So most of you know this, we can't get out of ourselves, nothing exists in a vacuum. So the fact that um, what we are doing is certainly an echo of our culture, things that move us, things that inspire us, our family, our friends, our associations, our personal experiences, and the experiences and the things we're going to be having in the future. So this is, and what we've seen, part of that is what we've seen and what we know. Someone will take your work in relationship to all those other things and also include that in what they know. So for me, parsing out what, what the flower is, is kind of what happens in art quite naturally, but it's quite nice to deconstruct it and think about it sometimes and to really get at that we are all part of this big conversation. The most important thing I think as contemporary artists we have to ask ourselves is one of relevance. So this is something that, okay, Harlan, I am spinning out here. I'm gonna go with it just for a little bit. <laughs> so this relevance bit is really important. And I think that's the struggle. This is my own opinion, okay? I think the relevance that one, each of us Look, anyone, artists or not, but artists, artists, visual artists, painters, poets, writers, painters or visual artists, of course, um, anyone who um, is involved in the arts, art, musicians, composers, are keenly aware of this condition of relevance. So it's about trying to count or do something
unique, that's loaded, but it somehow has to reflect us as individuals, all the while we know that we are compounds of various life experiences and various cultures and histories. Okay, moving on. So I started using these stencils for these drawings. I've got four images left here. And these I'm calling vining. And um, this process was uh, kind of a nice discovery for me. Um, basically, I, I have a, a vinyl cutter, stencil cutter. Uh, the vine images are based on photographs I've taken of wisteria vines. Early on in the talk, I showed that black and white image of the wisteria vines next to the Lakalan group, um, the ancient um, uh, sculpture um, representation of Lakalan group. Lakalan group. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll just for a quick I'll um, take this vine image and I'll put it in Illustrator, do a lot of tracing, pick out parts that I like, um, and then enlarge it in a scale and make a stencil. And then the stencils get then applied and drawn within and layered up. So that's how these vines actually have taken place. You can see some of the stencils on the floor there. Anyway, I, I was very um, fortunate um, to have that time. And it gave me this work to continue, which for me is, is um, has an urgency. I just can't wait to get back to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great.